Sony's PlayStation 2 is my favorite console. And if you are around in its heyday, there's a good chance it's yours too. It sold over 155 million units and housed a library close to 4,000 games before it was all said and done. And in retrospect, Sony themselves acquired the publishing rights to an impressive number of them. See, there was a time when Sony was even more of a powerhouse publisher than today. Nowadays, you see less first party games in lieu of more worldwide releases, not that you can even find a console to play them on, lol, but before all of this, and especially in the PS1 era, Sony published about a few dozen games a year between all regions. For the most part, the audience of western gamers were able to get their hands on most titles coming straight from Sony's pocketbook. There were few obscure projects that Sony decided not to bring stateside for different reasons though, and this little gem of a game, 2003's Chain Dive, was such a game. Chain Dive was developed by Alvian, a Japanese company that really, aside from providing developmental support on a handful of titles from Metal Gear Rising to Nier Automata, has really only created two other larger noteworthy projects on its own. There's Circadia, a visual novel style RPG from 1999, and Malicious, a fast paced action game that's been re-released a few times now as early as 2017 with Malicious Fallen. Actually, I peeped the trailer of this game while researching Alvian for this video, and yo, not gonna lie, this game looks pretty sick. I wanna try it sometime for sure. But anywho, what's Chain Dive about? What is Chain Dive? I'm going to try my best here. My Japanese sucks, but here's what I could come up with. So you're a shark, a man with mysterious powers that's tasked to protect the inhabitants of Elm, a world doomed by prophecy from these huge, ugly, toxin-spewing insects called Truva. Scientists research a mysterious area of ancient lore known as Odia, which is a ticket to finding something that can save mankind from the Truva called the Egg of the Gods. Or maybe it's just something that promotes life on Elm? I'm not sure. It's protected in a way by the princesses of Hidden Calavis. I'm pretty sure that's how it's pronounced. Hear it for yourself. And these princesses also conceal the power to control the egg. Main antagonist Messius has abilities similar to sharks and wants to use both the power of shark and the egg of the gods to control the Truva and... Wait, wait, here it comes. Try to take over the world. Well, kinda saw that one coming. Yeah, so I think Shark also has amnesia. But I don't even wanna go there today, let's just keep moving. <laughs> As you play, you learn more about the Truva, the origin of Shark's powers, which is something called Exceed, and his past connections with the rest of the cast. This is not a very import friendly game, and my Japanese needs a lot of work, so again, that's the best summary I can give you. If you can read Japanese and can at least translate the game's official plot synopsis, I'll post it here. Please at me on Twitter, I beg you. Apparently the final release is pretty different from its initial unveiling at 2003's Tokyo Game Show. The game's Japanese Wikipedia page states the game was announced with a show business theme and battle royale like elements before switching to its final sci-fi theme, kinda suggesting the events of the game may have been part of some grisly death game of sorts. Which considering the current trends of the gaming industry is one of the most ironic things I've read in recent memory. From what I understood, the plot is about finding a way off of Elm rather than saving it, so I guess that does line up with the original escapism narrative. Mm -hmm. 
But okay, if the plot is hard to grasp without brushing up on your Nihongo, the gameplay certainly isn't. To defend himself and those around him, Shark has standard attacks using a twin blade capable of turning his enemies to ice called the Unbreakable, that's a cool name, and a grappling hook, the Plasma Chain. The Plasma Chain is the game's greatest source of uniqueness and enjoyment. Shark can link it to various points across each level using both momentum and timing to zip across stages and shatter frozen enemies. If you're thinking of a love child between something like Bionic Commando and Zone of the Enders, I'd say you're onto something. You also have what the game calls a bomb attack, a powerful automated special move where Shark instantly freezes nearby enemies and zips across the stage shattering them one by one. You can actually do this as many times as you'd like in a level with the cost being one third of your HP. Killing Truva in succession however will rack up your combo counter which will heal you a bit based on how many kills you've racked up. It's a neat combat system that rewards good play, something every action game of its kind needs. Masterfully chaining between plasma points while blowing through your enemies bring a type of unique experience I've yet to have with any other game. Of course this doesn't come without its shortcomings though. For one, the default control scheme is pretty stupid since it assigns zipping to both enemies and plasma points with the same button. You can control the general direction of where you zip, but since Chain Dive uses an AI targeting system, you're pretty much rolling dice to figure out what you chain to if enemies and plasma points are near each other. But this can be remedied by switching the button layout and settings from default to expert, which splits up the task the plasma chain button accomplishes to two buttons, R1 to prioritize chaining to plasma points along the stage, and R2 for chaining to frozen enemies. I would say the other glaring issue combat wise is this unpredictable hit detection, particularly during boss fights and enemies that require more hits to shatter. The game's combo counter also acts as a damage multiplier, and it comes in handy against these more beefy enemies and bosses, but a lot of times these foes will have like individual weak points or breaking points that can be turned to ice and sit to, and you'll find Shark's chain attacks will often inexplicably miss these weak points. So here you are excessively ramming yourself into an enemy for little to no damage at all until you finally land a big hit to start your combo. It's a little bit frustrating. The game's stages have a lot of variety though, from rescue and defense missions and variety of boss fights sprinkled in to oh man defending this plane mid-flight as it barrel rolls through the sky, that one's my personal favorite. Even this god awful snowboarding level that, well, well you know what, no, actually that one might be one of the worst experiences you can have in gaming. But the game really does do a good job of keeping its ideas fresh. Chain Dive isn't a cakewalk by any means, due in part to the sheer anxiety you have as you look across rooftops, the sea, lava, you name it, knowing that a missing plasma point or two could mean certain death, but it isn't exactly unforgiving either. Enemies mostly take a backseat to your grappling or plasmaing, attacking just enough to be a nuisance as you find your way to the end of the level. Choke points are present, however, some stages can prove to be quite frustrating as you retry a few times to make amends. After each stage you're given letter grades on how you performed in up to five different aspects of a stage, so while it's a game with a single difficulty level that doesn't take longer than a lazy afternoon to beat, getting an S rank for each stage is quite the gargantuan task. It'll give you some of that good old replay value though. I want to talk about the graphics and presentation of Chain Dive, which is pretty lackluster for 2003. 
Details and animations were sacrificed in lieu of a target at 60 frames per second during gameplay, which it mostly does well maintaining. Mostly. But this was a year when games like Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time, Silent Hill 3, even The Getaway the year before it, and Metal Gear Solid 2 two years before it had made their mark, and it looks mediocre by comparison. There's a charm to the art direction though, the menus, the character and enemy designs, environments, they all have a nice artistic touch to them, even with this stuff going on. But okay, yeah, what I think is the single greatest aspect of the game, without a doubt, the soundtrack is killer. Absolutely fantastic. And the worst part about it is that you can't even buy it anywhere. Apparently there were 100 copies sold at the Tokyo Game Music Show in 2017. 100 copies, which is the first time I've ever heard of the Tokyo Game Music Show. Add that to your Japan bucket list. I even got desperate enough to message Technouchi, one of the main composers to the Chain Dive soundtrack, and asked if there was any different way I could perhaps purchase it, and to no avail. At the very least, if the game does not interest you at all, I absolutely recommend you find the game soundtrack and give it a listen. It is amazing, and I can't stress it enough, one of my favorite video game soundtracks to date. So it's 2021 and at the time of this video, you know, a time where suddenly everyone wants to inflate retro game prices on the aftermarket, you can find a used copy of Chain Dive in good condition from your usual secondhand shops for around $50 with new copies fetching well over 100 now. It's pretty apparent that Chain Dive was slated at some point for a US release. It was even featured on the demo disc bundled with issue 79 of the official US PlayStation magazine. but. Ultimately, it never saw light in the states. I don't believe there was ever an official statement regarding its cancellation, but the game was definitely met with a very lukewarm reception in Japan, and that's the most likely cause for the change of heart. Oh, yeah, so I still need to get to my title to wrap things up. Is Chain Dive the best Sony published Japan exclusive in their history? This question's pretty subjective, right? Honestly, the Popolo Kreuz series seems pretty cool as well, particularly the second game in the series, which never released here in the States. And you know what? I'm not even going to call Chain Dive the most obscure one. Base Paradox beats it there too. So, I don't know. Chain Dive definitely had clear flaws, but also had everything to make itself a cult following here in the West. I sincerely love the game. With nothing breaking your momentum and gameplay, you feel agile and powerful. It's smooth, it sounds great, and boasts a lot of variety for an adventure you can beat in just a few hours. It really sucks to miss this one in its heyday, and I think it's certainly worth looking into it if it piques your interest. So, how'd I do? Did you like this video at all? Are you interested in trying Chain Dive? Are you Chain Dive's biggest fan? Leave a like and comment below. Feel free to subscribe if you like videos like this. It's the first of a handful of projects I'm working on and I'd love to hear back from you. But until then, thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you next time.